and give them warning from me. So I want you to notice a couple of things that God says unto Ezekiel there. Number one, he says, I am the promise that you promised me. You know, and this is the gospel. This is an unconditional promise. They preach the gospel to people. They start a church, and then that church starts preaching the gospel. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Amen. Amen. All right. Tonight I'm going to be preaching on the subject of husbands loving your wives. Husbands love your wives. I want to focus here specifically in Ephesians chapter number 5. <clears throat> Let's begin in verse number 22. The Bible says this, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Verse 24, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And then here we get some advice to the husband specifically. Husbands, Love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Verse 26, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Now here in Ephesians chapter number 5, of course, we see some advice that is given in order to have a successful marriage. We specifically see that the husband is addressed individually and then after that, or actually before that really, in, in the order of the wife coming first, she is given a specific tip or given specific advice. And of course this is uh, advice in order to have a successful marriage. But then we see something directed specifically at the husbands. And that's what I'm going to be focusing on tonight is for in order to have a successful marriage, what does the husband have to do on his part? What does the husband have to do on his part? So I'm going to be giving a few different tips <clears throat> Biblical tips that are given to the man, to the husband, in order to have a good marriage and in order to fulfill his role as the husband. This, I believe, is the, is the strongest, the most powerful uh, advice that is given. And one, number one, uh, I believe, is because this is repeated elsewhere. And we're going to go to that again. Now, in the Bible, when you see something being repeated, that is because it is very important. If you remember when Pharaoh had his dream... Uh, he had his dream, it was doubled. And do you remember why Joseph said that it was doubled? He said because it was going to be very grievous. That means that it's very significant or it's very important, right? So when you see something that is doubled, that means that it's very important. We see that this advice is given here in Ephesians 5. This is also repeated in the book of Colossians. So this, I believe, is really uh, the most powerful advice. It's really elaborated on. And uh, it's really the most extreme advice that's given because when we look at this, and we take it literal, this is what it says that ha and how a husband should love his wife. Look once more at verse number, <clears throat> let's look at verse number 25. It says this, Husbands, love your wives. And then it goes on to say this, Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, don't just stop where it says, Husbands, love your wives. He actually gives you an example and he actually elaborates unto you what that means to love your wife. Now, women are also commanded to love their husbands, but they are not commanded to love their husbands in the same way that a man is commanded to love his wife. You are supposed to show your love in a different way. Women, the main advice that is given to women is to submit unto their husband. That is how they love their husbands. But do you know how a man is, is supposed to show his love to his wife? is through a sacrificial love. What we see here is it says again, husbands love your wife, wife, and then it says this, even as Christ also loved the church, and it says, and gave himself for it. So of course, Jesus Christ loved us so much. Those that believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, those that put our faith in him, of course he died for the whole world, but specifically we took advantage of that. That's why he's pointing that out. He loved us so much that he was willing to die. He was willing to give his own life. Of course, there was a lot that added, that entailed, being beaten, being spit upon, being mocked. You know, the derision that came into play with that as well. But he was willing to give up his own life. Now, let's take the Bible literally. We're fundamentalists, right? I believe that this is literal. Now, of course, there are other applications to this. But I believe that you should love your wife 
Just as Christ loved the church, even as Christ loved the church, a man, a husband of a household, should be willing to die for his wife. He should be willing to lay down his life for his wife if it came to that. Now, I'll give you a, a perfect example. Men should be the protectors of their homes. And if, if there is, for whatever reason, an invasion into your household, the man should be willing to get up and to protect his family, to protect his wife, of course also to protect his children, and if need be, he should be willing to die for his wife or die for his family. I believe that that's literal. But not only that, of course, all throughout our lives there should be areas where we are sacrificing for our wives. There should be areas where we are sacrificing our own, whatever it may be, ambitions, our own wills, our own wants, and our own desires. <clears throat> there should be a daily sacrifice that is going on on behalf or on part, on the part of husbands where they are sacrificing for their wives. This is an essential instruction that is given to the men. This is something that you should be doing in your relationship all the time. How often does your wife is your wife commanded to submit to you? Just like a couple of days out of the week, a couple of minutes out of the day, all the time. You should be daily living your life as a husband, endeavoring to be sacrificing for your wife. And also, of course, this goes by extension to your children, but primarily what I'm speaking about right now is sacrificing for your wife. This should be a sacrificial love. We can look at different areas of this, and as I mentioned, just wants, just desires. You know, if there's some sort of hard work that needs to be done, you should be doing it. If there's something that, in any way, that maybe your wife is struggling with, why don't you step in and you help your wife out? If there's something, maybe maybe it doesn't even have to be labor intensive. Of course, if your wife is struggling with something as far as strength and she's not able to do it, you should be doing that job. That's a job for you. But not only that, if there is something that is, uh, that is time consuming and your wife is struggling, your wife is having trouble, you know what you can do? Sacrifice your own time and help her. You say, hey, I'm busy. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure, you know, Christ could have had other things that he could have done too, my friend, right? Of course, that's the reason that he came, but the point still stands. He was willing, with what he was given, the life that he had on this earth, he was willing to give that up for you. That's the whole point, or it's not a sacrifice, right? The whole point is that you are giving something up. You could be doing something else with your time, and you are choosing that I'm going to sacrifice this, whatever it may be, and I'm going to help you out in whatever area that this may be. Now, we're going to look at this in a couple of different aspects, a couple of different angles. I want you to go with me to Colossians chapter number 3 where we see this repeated. Colossians chapter number 3. <clears throat> Colossians chapter number 3, <clears throat> verse number 19 is where we're going to look. The Bible says this. We'll, we'll read verse 18 again. It says this. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. And then I'll go ahead and read verse 20. This is speaking. Of course, he addresses the family one by one. The children now. Verse 20. Children, obey your parents in all things for this is well pleasing unto the Lord. So we see there that he gives one piece of advice to each member of the family. This is how if you want to have a functional family and not a dysfunctional family, you follow the Lord's advice, of course. You follow the Bible. That is where we'll find a prosperous, successful marriage and a prosperous, successful uh, household. What is the advice that's given to the husbands? Again, we see the exact same thing being repeated. It tells us, husbands, love your wives. It goes on to say, and be not bitter against them. But if we compare this to Ephesians chapter number 5, what type of love specifically is it? It is meant to be a sacrificial love. A sacrificial love. I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter number 2, verse number 20. Genesis chapter number 2, verse number 20. We're going to see the, the creation of woman. Genesis chapter number 2, verse number 20. See the first marriage, the first man and woman, the first husband and wife. <coughs> Genesis chapter number 2, we're going to look at, as I said, uh, verse number 20. The end of the chapter there, verse number 20, it says this, and, and Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found and help meet for him. 
Now here when, when it's speaking, I've heard, I, I know I explained this one other time, I believe, when we were in Genesis chapter number 2. Atheists will try to mock this passage and say, well, you know, uh, at that time, you know, they thought maybe Adam could have had a help, uh, you know, and, and help meet means fit, like a help meet for him, you know, through one of the animals. That's not what this is saying at all. It's saying they all had... Uh, uh, you know, a, a, a mate, if you will. They all had a companion, but for him there was not one that was made yet. Because remember, there were commands that were given after each type of animal was created, each kind of animal was given, uh, was created. There were commands given, be fruitful and multiply. So there was two of each, right? But then it just points out the fact there at the end of verse number 20, it says, but for Adam there was not found and help meet for him, saying a help that was fit for him, Right? So he didn't have anyone that was there that was meant to be his companion or meant to be his, his counterpart. That's probably a good way to put it. Some, you know, someone that would be perfect or fit for him. That's what meet there means, right? His counterpart. What completed him. Look at verse number 21. <clears throat> and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. That means in the place. <coughs> Verse 22, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. And then it goes on in verse number 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife. And then it says, and they shall be one flesh. And then verse 25, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now I want you to notice there in verse number 24, it says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. So what's the reason why he should leave his father and his mother? And it is what? Verse number 23, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. If you remember in Ephesians chapter number 5, what did it say that we were of Christ now, being as the body of Christ? What are we? We are, it says, specifically, bone of his bone, and we are flesh of his flesh, saying that we are a part of that body. Now, now, if we would have went in deeper to this and compared it to 1 Corinthians 11 as well, uh, we, would have, we would have seen that, you know, Christ is specifically referred to uh, in more depth as the head, and then we are as, like it's called, the body, right? We are the body. So he is the head, and we are the body. That was also alluded to, but not in great detail, in Ephesians 5. And it was comparing that scenario or that situation with the situation with husband and wife. And what it was was the man or the husband would be the counterpart, if you will, to Christ, right? They would be the head. So the man is the head, but then the woman is what? She would be the body. Just like us as saved believers, the local church is the body of Christ. So I wanted to draw that parallel with you. That's going to become more and more uh, important because I want you to see this typology between, you know, saved believers, those that put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? You know, uh, and then also the typology or that typology compared to the church uh, and, I'm sorry, and the husband and wife, right? Now I want you to look with me at uh, Genesis chapter number three. Genesis chapter number three. So just look should be just a couple of verses down from where we were there. Just spill over into the next chapter. Genesis chapter number 3. We'll just start reading and get the context in verse number 1. It says this, Now the, spirit, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, <clears throat> neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. So what was the, 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 the first lie here? It was, she was told very clearly, You're not going to die. When God said that they would die. Verse number 5, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. <coughs> And ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat. And then it says this, And gave also unto her husband with her, 
and he did eat. I want you to keep your hand here and go over to 1 Timothy chapter number uh, 2. 1 Timothy chapter number 2. We find some important information in the New Testament about this uh, specific event. Now, in this situation, who does the... Who, again, let me remind you, who does the... Uh, who does the, the, the body of Christ, what is the counterpart to that in the typology of husband and wife? The body of Christ. Church. That's the church. And who would they line up with when it comes to husband and wife? The wife, right? They would be the wife. Now we see the body of Christ is made up of who? It's saved believers, right? We sinned against God. We sinned against the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And we know that, as we just read here, Eve, what did she do? She took of the fruit and she did eat, right? What did she do? She sinned against God, right? I want you to look here in 1 Timothy chapter number 2. We find a very interesting detail about what took place there in verse number 6. It tells you this, For Adam was formed first, first then Eve. Then it says in verse 14, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now, isn't that extremely important? Just the significant tip that's given us in the New Testament. It says what? It says that Adam was not deceived. Now, we're not told that here when we read in verse number 6. All it says is this. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And then it says, And gave also unto her husband with her. And then it says, And he did eat. So, who does the husband represent? Who does the husband represent in the typology? It would represent Christ, right? Now, if you just stop and think about it, it doesn't take very long to figure out what's going on here. Number one, <clears throat> what was Eve deceived with? What was the lie that the serpent told her? It's very simple. What was it? Ye shall not surely die. So she was deceived into believing that she was not going to die when she ate of this fruit. Now, she had already eaten of the fruit, right? She had already sinned. But then she took of that fruit... And she gave also unto her husband. And the Bible is very clear that her husband was not deceived. So he did not believe what? What did he know when he ate of that fruit? He knew without a shadow of a doubt that what was going to happen. He was going to die. Not only that, if he understood that about himself, what did he also understand about his wife? That she was going to die that she was going to die. So if we look at the scenario and we look at what took place here and we're given this little tidbit of, of information in the New Testament that tells us that he was not deceived. It doesn't take a, a, a rocket scientist to deduce the reason why Adam was willing to eat of the fruit. Because why? He knew that his wife was going to die. So do you know what Adam was willing to do? Adam was willing to die for her or to die with her. We saw, we saw there the, the, the parallel that was drawn, the typology of Christ being willing to die for the church. And it said it was the body. What was right here? And, so we were, and then it also told us that, he was, that, that we are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. Where is that quoting from? It's quoting from Genesis chapter number 2. Verse number 23 and 24. And actually, Genesis, both of those verses are actually quoted. Genesis 20, uh, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 2, 23 and 24 are both quoted in Ephesians chapter number 5. What we have here is we have the first man and the first woman. We have the first husband and the first wife. And many times throughout the New Testament, Christ is likened unto Adam. Christ is, is, is actually referred to as the last Adam, right? You have the first Adam, and then you have the last Adam. Not only that, the way in which Adam sinned and condemned all of mankind, in the same way it says that Christ, He redeemed all of mankind. By His righteousness, He was, willing to he was able to redeem all of mankind. So we see this strong parallel drawn between who? Between Adam and and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we see, of course, the body of Christ being likened unto, which are saved believers, of course, that put their faith in Christ, being likened unto the wife. And what do we see the very first husband and wife? What took place? There's no other answer. If you try to rack your brain, what else would have compelled him to eat of that fruit? He knew that she's going to die. So you know what he decided to do? He wasn't deceived, so I'm going to eat of the fruit as well. Do you know what he was willing to do? He was willing to sacrifice himself for his wife. That's what took place here. Now, yeah, really, there really is, you can think about it all you want, there really is no other answer. Now, we can learn greatly 
from what Adam did here. Adam is actually an excellent example. But let me explain this first. Obviously, Adam's sin was not good. But Adam's love, great love and adoration that he had for his wife was obviously a good example for us today. Where Adam literally, in a very literal sense, was willing to die for his wife. Obviously, there are problems with what Adam did. You know, Adam, in this case, he would have put Eve before God. That's, that's wrong, and that's obviously sinful, right? That you should never prioritize things where your wife is more important than God, right? You know, God should always be at the top. But the aspect where we can learn from Adam was that he loved his wife so much that he was willing to die. He was not deceived. He knew that he was going to die. He was willing to die with his wife. He knew that if I eat of that fruit, he knew she's dying already. She's going to die. And if I eat of that fruit, I'm going to die as well. And he weighed the options and he said, I love her so much, whatever happens, I want it to happen to me too. Yeah, I think it was a real man who had to contemplate these thoughts, the very first man. And that was the option or the choice that he, or the, the, you know, the venue that he went down. That was the route that he went down. Why? What would, what would compel him? Nothing else besides the fact that he loved his wife. So we see right here this great parallel, the first husband and wife. And what do we see? We see a self-sacrificing type of love. We see a great love where he was willing to sacrifice himself for or in the place with his wife, if you will, for his own life. I want you to go now to, um, let's go to uh, Proverbs chapter, actually I have you turn to 1 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 7. So the most important part about being a husband is husbands love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. You should be sacrificing. You should, you should love your wife so much that you are sacrificing yourself, whether it be your time, whatever it may be, for your wife. For your wife. <clears throat> if you understood the value of your wife, then maybe you would be more willing to sacrifice things for her. Proverbs 18.22 says this, Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. If we understood the great value of having a wife, then we would be even more so willing to sacrifice ourselves for our wives. 1 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 7, we're also given uh, um, some, some advice on being good husbands. It says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, talking about your wives, <coughs> according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. We see that that same concept here that's, that's taught about being uh, uh, self-sacrificing. It says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. And it says, Giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. That is, that's conveying the concept that even if you think of it in a, in a sense of physical strength, your wife is not as strong as you. And if she is, then you need to hit the gym quick, right? Your wife is not as strong as you are. She, she, you know, she should not be as strong as you. So you know what you need to do? You need to show honor to her by helping her when she needs help, if you think of it in a physical way. Maybe in other ways, you know, women are, are not as strong, you know, especially emotionally, right? There's probably a bigger gap there. I know with, with, with my wife, goodness sakes, no, I'm just kidding. But there's a, there's a gap there either way, right, emotionally, where, you know, uh, women will just break down and start crying or something will bother them just, like, quickly. And I'm like, whoa, 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 calm down. This is not a big deal, right? You know, he spilled milk. No, I'm just kidding. Whatever it may be, right? So women will just like, you know, ju they'll just real fast, you know, they'll, 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 they'll lose their minds about things. And they'll, they'll get very, you know, upset and, 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 and they'll fret themselves about whatever it may be. You know what you need to do? You need to show honor unto your wife. I realize that was funny, but, but, but truly, you need to calm your wife down. That's what you need to do. You need to, be, you need to care about your wife and you need to step up and you need to be the leader. You need to uh, give honor unto her as unto the weaker vessel. You need to stop thinking about yourself and start sacrificing the things that you're thinking about, whatever you're doing, and go to her and take some time and help her with whatever she needs help with. You need to go and, 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 uh, and maybe comfort her, whatever she may need from you. You know what you need to do? You need to look at the, the great love that Christ had for the body of Christ and what He was willing to do. What mattered to Him? 
You know, if you will, his wife is what mattered to him. Amen. What mattered to Adam? Hey, he messed up and, and in so doing, he made a terrible decision. But do you know what we can learn from? The great love that Adam had for Eve. The great love that the, the first husband had for his wife. That's the type of love that you need to have for your wife. You know what kind of love it is? A self-sacrificing type of love. That should be what you strive for in order to be a great husband. If you can get that, you are going down the right path. That is what's stressed throughout the Bible. A few different situations. I want you to go to uh, Proverbs chapter number 5, verse number 16 with me. Proverbs chapter number 5, verse number 16. Another thing that was mentioned there in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 is, Likewise, ye husbands, it says, dwell with them according to knowledge. You should know your wives. You should know their likes. You should know their dislikes. You should know the things that they like to eat. You should just know what they like. You should know the things that they like said to them and the things that they do not like said to them, right? You know, you should just know your wife in general. Why? Because you love her. If you love your wife, you will get to know your wife. Because you are interested in your wife. If you are interested in her and you love her, you know what you'll do? You'll just naturally get to know her. You just would do that naturally. But even outside of that, you need to make a concerted effort. To dwell, because it's a commandment. Dwell with your wives according to knowledge. Know your wife. Know what she likes. Know what she dislikes in every area. Proverbs chapter number 5. The Bible says this. <laughs> Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad in rivers of waters in the streets. Let them be only thine own and not strangers with thee. Let thy fountain be blessed. And we can see that this was allegorical right here. It was just you know, uh, 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 a metaphor. It says this, And rejoice with the wife of thy use. Let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times. And then it says, And be thou ravished always with her love. Notice it uses the word ravished. Now, ravished is a word that is like, it means to be like overwhelmed. That's what the word ravished means. It means that you are like overwhelmed with something. You are like taken over with something. That's the kind of love that we should have for our wives. Man. As men, we should, have a, we should have a love for our wives where it's a love that we're, we're willing to sacrifice ourselves for our, wives, for our wives. We should be willing to sacrifice our own lives, our own time, whatever is important unto us. We should be willing to set that aside, just like Christ did, just like Adam did, for our wives. We should know our wives. If you don't know your wife, sadly it's because you don't have enough interest in her. And that's not good. You need to dwell with your wife according to knowledge. You need to uh, honor her as the weaker vessel. Step up and be a man. You know, in the world, the world is lacking men, my friend. There are no men out there. Now, God forbid that we would have just a bunch of sissy men in here too that aren't able to take care of the weaker vessel, right? That aren't able to, be, to stand up and be a man. I mean, let the world do what they're going to do, right? But you, you need to stand up and be a man of God. You need to stand up and be a man like the Bible commands you to be. And that is a strong man. That's a man that is able to lead his wife and to make decisions for his wife. And it's not just obsessed with himself. It's not just sitting around and playing video games or sitting around and just watching whatever he wants to watch and thinking about all the things that are on his mind and tinkering with all the things that he wants to do. It should be a man that's interested in his family. It should be a man that's interested in his wife and that's interested in her likes and her dislikes. Be a man like Christ. Be a man like Adam and be a man that's willing to sacrifice his own interests and be a man that's willing to sacrifice his own desires and his own wants for his wife. This is what's commanded to men. This is what's commanded specifically to husbands. Stop being satisfied with having a mediocre life in any area. Stop being satisfied with having maybe a mediocre marriage. You know, I don't know everyone's situation in here. Maybe everybody doesn't even have a mediocre. Maybe you don't even have a good marriage. I have no idea. But you know what? You need to not even, not only should you not want to have a bad marriage and tr should be trying to fix that, but stop being satisfied with just doing mediocre in every area of life. Amen. We are given the recipe of success and prosperity in the Word of God. God wants you and desires for you to have a good marriage. God wants <clears throat> husbands to love their wives and wives to love their husbands and to be happy and rejoice with the wife of your youth. Do you know what you need to do? You need to start actually putting these things 
into practice. You need to actually start the things that are practical, take them and start using them in, in your life. If you want to know how to have a great marriage, husbands, love your wives. And step up and be willing to sacrifice things for your wives. Be willing to sacrifice time. Be willing to sacrifice money. Be willing to sacrifice things that just have that, that, that you like and your wants and your desires. To lay that aside and stop living your life for yourself, but rather start living your life for your wife. Start thinking about your, 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 your wife's wants and your wife's desires. Now, I'm not, talking, I'm not trying to get you to become henpecked. I'm not trying to get you to go around and just, just, what do you want, honey? What do you want me to do here? And there, obviously, you know, with all things, there's moderation, right? You know, but, but you know what? We need to not be living our lives every day for ourselves. We need to not be living our lives based upon our own, our own wants and our own desires every day. When it comes to our marriage and the decisions that are made as husband and wife and things like that, we need to try to put our wife first, any opportunity possible. It's a command that's given unto you. You need to try to put your wife first. When your wife needs something, you know, if you can see your wife struggling especially, try to go help her. Go help her, whatever it may be with. If she's working on a project, say, hey, what can you do? What can I do to help you? Right? You know, you know I, I, even if you're working on something and you're busy, you know what? Stay up a little later, baby. If you've got to go help her for a little while, stay up a little bit later and go help her with what she's doing. You know what you'd have to do? You'd have to sacrifice a little bit of sleep there. But when we actually start talking about sacrificing things, that's when people start getting like... Ah, 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 ah. Yeah, like a baby, whining and crying like a baby. You know what? Stop putting yourself first. And start putting your wife first in areas like this. When it's this marriage, this is what the, the man is commanded to do. Being willing to lay down his things. His, uh, whatever of his. Whatever it may be of his. And, then, and, and to die for his wife. To, to sacrifice things for his wife. This is the attitude that we should have. Uh, 1 Peter chapter number 4, verse number 8, I'll just read you. It says this. Notice it was right, right after 1 Peter 3, 7. We see this, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. And it says, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Now, when this is quoted in the Old Testament, it's quoted as love. We see here, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. They're very similar words. If you want to have... If you want to have a, a good relationship, one of the major keys that both need to have, uh, major attributes that both need to possess, is the ability to forgive. It's the ability to forgive. Because you know what a marriage is? It's two people that are sinners, that are imperfect, that have a bunch of problems, tons. You know, some more than others. No, I'm just kidding. But have a lot of issues, right? And they're saying, hey, we're going to become one. Whatever you have, whatever I have, we're going to just make it one. We're going to come together. We're going to make our own decisions. I was wondering why you had that weird look on your face. We're going to make our own decisions. We're going to make our, our, our you know, uh, I was thinking about what she was, my kombucha almost rolled off here. Um, you know, we're going, to, we're going to lay our, you know, whatever we have right now, we're going to leave father and mother and we're going to come together. Whatever possessions we have, we're going to put those together. We're going to come together and we're going to become one. Start living under you know, uh, the same roof. We're going to have children together. Obviously the husband's the head, but there's obviously a discussion that takes place when decisions are made and things like that. The husband's the ultimate you know, executor of those decisions, but, but there's still discussion that will be said, right? That will be, that will be had. But you know what? You're becoming one with two imperfect people, two sinners who got a lot of, I mean, face it, a lot of problems. A lot of character flaws, just sinning constantly, right? There's none righteous, no, not one. So you're going to sin against each other all the time. You're going to hurt each other's feelings all the time. You're going to you know, tick each other off all the time. You're going to do all those things that annoy your spouse, right? That she or he wants you to stop doing. So you know what you have to do? You know, you know how to keep that marriage together? Do you know what you have to be able to keep doing repeatedly? Sometimes on a daily basis... Forgive. 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 Do you know what Christ had to do when he gave himself? He had to forgive. Right? Think about that. We sinned against God. Right? We received forgiveness. And he was willing to do that. It's another perfect example of that. You know? 
So, both, both can learn from both aspects. You know, even, even if you think about it, we compare it to 1 Corinthians 11, Christ is a, can be even a great example uh, you know, to the women. You know how? Because he, as a man, was willing to be subject to God. He knows what it's like. He knows what it's like. But then also, he was willing and was able to give himself on behalf of, right? And was able to be the head, right, also. So you know, you know what you need to do? Both need to be very forgiving. You know what covers all those sins? Charity. Love. So you need to have great love for one another. Like, uh, I'll say this to my wife. I said to my wife, just kidding around today. Like in the book of uh, Song of Solomon, when the, the woman is speaking unto Solomon, she says, For I am sick of love. When I'll kiss my wife sometimes, I'll say that to her. But that's the attitude we should have. I'll say to her, I am sick of love. She knows what I mean. We need to have an attitude where we just love our wives. Where we deeply and strongly, where we are ravished with her love. We need to love our wives. Do you know what kind of love we need to have, though, specifically? We need to have a sacrificial love. Amen. We need to have a sacrificial love. Uh, turn to Ecclesiastes <clears throat> chapter number 9. This is going to be the very last verse that we read. Ecclesiastes chapter number 9. We're going to end here. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes chapter number 9. God wants you to have a happy marriage. God wants you to enjoy your wife. God wants you uh, to enjoy your husbands, right? He wants, <clears throat> he wants happiness for marriage. That's what he desires. That's why he gives us the recipe for happiness, for uh, prosperity and, and great success when it comes to marriage, when it comes to the, the relationship between husband and wife. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter number 9. Look at verse number 9. It says this, Live joyfully with the, with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity. And then he goes on, Which he hath given thee under the sun all the days of thy vanity. For that is thy portion in this life and in thy labor which thou takest under the sun. One of the things in life that we are meant to enjoy, one of the main things that God wants us to enjoy as husbands is our wife. It's our wife. But we need not to neglect all the commandments that are given to us as husbands. And we need not to take advantage of the position of being a husband and being the boss. You know, and your wife, you know, shame on you if your wife is, is fulfilling that role and she is submitting unto you. And then you're just this selfish jerk that's not doing anything for her and you're not being sacrificial for her. You know, shame on you, seriously. She's willing to be a godly woman and a godly wife. And then you're just obsessed with yourself and everything that you do. You know, you need to have sacrificial love. You need to love your wife like Christ loved the church. You know what you need to do? You need to love your wife like Adam loved Eve. That's what you need to do. And be willing to sacrifice yourself for her. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord.